character. I feel like I'm so far away from you. If you'd like to, you don't have to, but. Did you pray already? Yeah. Well, we're going to pray again. <laughs> In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our Lord and our Savior, our King and our God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to stand before your holy altar, to praise your name, to sing your hymns. We ask the Lord always to please be with us in everything that we do, guide our service, guide all the things, O Lord, that we do for the glory of your holy name. Give us the strength and the guidance and the grace and the peace and the knowledge and the wisdom of your Holy Spirit. And hear us, O Lord, through the prayers of the great modern wonder worker, St. Mina, the great archangel, and the intercessions of Our Lady, St. Mary, the ever-virgin, the holy Theotokos. Firstly and lastly, hear us when we humbly and thankfully cry out and say to you, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. It's a great joy, joy for me today to be with you tonight, uh, to speak to you about something that uh, really touches the heart of our service and is something that is on the minds of everyone throughout um, our society and even the world. And it's a topic that, you know, sometimes we stand before and we think, well, what in the world am I going to say? How can I defend this? Is the Bible a fraud? Is it a fable? Is it a myth? Is it authentic? Is it a fact? What is it? And many people today, uh, because of the time that we're in, are looking for guidance, divine guidance. But they're looking in many strange places. You know, have you noticed the psychic places and the crystal balls and the Madame Olga places are starting to pop up everywhere? I don't know. I, every time I drive by, I see a new one, psychic, $5 a reading or something like that. They're looking for uh, divine guidance in many different ways and many different places. But they're all actually wrong. They're looking for the supernatural, but they forget that God has already revealed himself to us through his Holy Bible. Uh, if there's anything, making sure my phone is off, hope you do the same. If there's anything that really hits the heart of our service, it's this idea of the authenticity of the Bible, the veracity of the Bible, the truth of the Bible. And the Holy Bible has been attacked very severely since the past, maybe specifically, if you look at the history, about 200 years, the past 200 years. And we've heard many objections. We've heard many claims of contradiction. We've heard many uh, sayings like it's unreliable, it's not the word of God, but it's the word of man. We hear that it's mythology. Okay, and even the Roman Catholic Church teaches parts of the book of Genesis to be mythology. If, I don't know if you knew that or not. It's very alarming to me when I hear that they teach the first chapters of the book of Genesis as mythology. And Adam means many men, Eve means many women and so forth. So sometimes you don't know where the truth is. And even us, we're very truthful. We're very to the point. We believe in the inspiration of the Bible. We believe that it's authentic. We believe that it's the Word of God. But yet, many doubts come to mind. And this doubt has been 
since the beginning. When the serpent came to Eve in Genesis 3.1 and said, Has God indeed said that you should not eat from the... And then he continues, you know the rest of it. Has God indeed said? Has he indeed said? This is the question. And you have, you have this doubt in everybody's mind. Has really God said in his word? And if he has, well, you know what? We're going to discredit the word of God. Okay? Tonight's presentation is pretty long. It's very extensive and very detailed. So I'm going to try to go through it as quick as I can. If you can just keep your questions to the end, it will probably be better. Uh, if you really, really, really have to ask the question, you can raise your hand. Where do these attacks come from? When did they start? I'll give you a brief history. There was this group of 70 scholars, and they formed this Jesus seminar. And their basic objective was to find out how much of what is written in the Gospels, how much of it is true, how much of it is authentic. And they went and they did extensive biblical research through the method of biblical criticism. But I don't call it biblical criticism. I call it biblical vandalism. Because biblical criticism, which is a, a critical or a, a literal look at the text of the Gospels, and actually the whole Bible, is turning into not what it the the, uh, the point of it was was to learn more it's actually turning into biblical vandalism they're vandalizing the word of god and this is what these 70 scholars decided this is what they came up with christ did not claim to be the messiah or to be divine christ did not ask the people to believe in him or to worship him christ did not tell people to believe that his death would be a sacrifice for their sins. And basically, their thesis, you know, they come up with a thesis. The major claims of Christianity are demonstrably untrue and has brought more harm than good to the world. I'm just telling you what we're dealing with, okay, as a way of introduction. And I'm spending a lot of time on the introduction, you'll notice, almost half of the lecture, because you have to be aware, as a Bible-believing, Orthodox, Coptic Christian, that a, what are the attacks, and what are your kids that you're, that you're serving are hearing from either their teachers in school, which it happens, from maybe even their friends, and definitely, if you serve the older people, okay, like the colleges and the graduates, you know, it's paganism and atheism all over our campuses. So you need to understand what you're up against. <clears throat> Mr. Lloyd Graham, he says the Bible in his book, Deceptions and the Myth of the Bible, the Bible is not the word of God, but a steal from pagan sources. You look at somebody like Max Nordeaux, who was a philosopher in the 19th century. We find collected in this book, he's talking about the Bible, the superstitious beliefs, superstitious, beliefs of the ancient inhabitants of Palestine with indistinct echoes of Indian, Persian fables, mistaken imitation of Egyptian theories and customs, historical chronicles as dry as they are, unreliable, and coarseness <clears throat> and bad taste. This is what they're saying about your book, by the way. Okay? I, when I was doing the research for this, I think my blood pressure went up 40 points. Okay? Especially in a few uh, slides, you're going to see the craziness of what's going on. The Da Vinci Code, something that you all have heard about and lived through. In the Da Vinci Code, page 231, it says, The Bible is a product of man, my dear, not of God. The Bible did not fall <clears throat> magically from the clouds. Man created it as a historical record of tumultuous times. It has evolved through countless translations, additions, revisions. History has never have a, had a definitive version of the book. You know how many millions of copies he sold of the Da Vinci Code? 
This is what made my blood pressure go up. Bishop John Spong. He's a retired bishop of Episcopal, the Bishop of Newark. And he wrote many, many, many books. One of them is those two that you see on the screen. And the next slide are a few. Just I want you to take a, a look and read the titles to yourself. Living in sin. Look at, look at the, I don't know if you could see the symbols, male and female symbols. But there's two males, two females. Two males, a male and a female. Two females, a male and a female. A male separate, a female separate, and then a female and a male again. Okay? Living in sin with a big question mark. You know what those symbols mean. Look at what else he wrote. The bishop wrote this. Eternal life, a new vision, beyond religion, beyond theism, meaning God, belief in God, beyond heaven and hell. Is your blood pressure up yet? It will now. Resurrection, myth or reality? A bishop searched for the origins for the origins of Christianity. Rescuing the Bible from fundamentalism. A bishop rethinks the meaning of scripture. Some people are gay. Get over it. Why Christianity must change or die. A new Christianity for a new world. The sins of Scripture. The sins of Scripture. Okay? So, not only are we, do we have attacks from the secular society and from other religions and from atheists and from pagans, we even have it from within, quote, I use the term very loosely when I speak about this group or this person, church or Christian. Look at what he says. The deceased man did not walk out of his grave physically alive three days after his execution by crucifixion. In a very short time, only some unmarkable, unmarked bones remained. Even the bones were gone before too long. Resurrection, myth, or reality, page 241. These are quotes from his other books. The biblical story of perfect and finished creation fell into sin is pre-Darwinian mythology and post-Darwinian nonsense. This is a bishop saying this, guys. The virgin birth, understood as literal biology, makes Christ's divinity as traditionally understood, impossible. The miracle stories of the New Testament can no longer be interpreted in a post-Newtonian world as supernatural events performed by an, in, thank you, by an incarnate deity. Okay? All these are hitting directly against the major beliefs of the incarnation, of creation, of the divinity of our Lord. You don't have the incarnation. You don't have divinity of our Lord. You don't have any of these things that he's saying. You don't have Christianity. You don't have the church. You have nothing except a regular book. Look at this one. The view of the cross as the sacrifice for the sins of the world is a barbarian idea based on primitive concepts of God and must be dismissed. Resurrection is an action of God. Jesus was raised into the meaning of God. I, therefore, cannot be a physical resuscitation occurring inside human history. The Bible is not the primary source of divine... You know what? I don't even want to continue because it's making me upset. Muslims and the Holy Bible. This is what they say. The book now circulated among Christians, the Old and New Testament, are not those which the Quran refers to or at least not in their present state, for they have become <clears throat> corrupted and annulled. Page 2, page 43 from Mizan al-Haq. So, <clears throat> many challenges, my beloved. Many challenges. 
what are we to do? Are we to just sit down and take it? Are we to just shut our mouths and say, well, somebody else will do it? Somebody else will defend it? Are we to just do nothing? And when we hear a comment from one of the kids that you serve, you know, you brush it off. What are we to do? Well, let's see what our book tells us to do. Walk in wisdom that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Colossians 4. Okay, so maybe instead of spending a lot of time doing wasteful things, because you're not ordinary people now. You are called to be the servants of the Most High God, which means you have a huge responsibility on your shoulders, which means you have to sacrifice things, which means you have to sacrifice time, which means you have to let go of the things that waste your time and look for things that can help you serve those who are you, you are responsible for. You have to, the biggest tragedy in our churches, in all churches, you have a servant who has no feeling of responsibility. You have three, four people in a class, right? You're serving third grade, let's say. Nobody knows when the, what the lesson is next week. Today's Thursday, right? Nobody knows the lesson. None of the four people. Three of them are planning, or actually more, maybe four of them are planning not to show up. Nobody knows. Nobody communicates. Nobody cares. Nobody talks to the kids. Nobody does anything. That's the tragedy in our churches. You see? St. Paul, look, think about this. St. Paul almost single-handedly converted the entire new, um, the entire existing world at the time of the New Testament. Single-handedly. Yeah, he had St. Mark to help him, St. Barnabas and some others, St. Timothy. But it was basically him. The entire world. And look at how many of us are in here. We really need to rethink about this word servant, okay? And we really need to step up to the responsibility of it. Walk in wisdom, my beloved, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Now, and I'm not meaning, I don't mean the critics. I mean just the kids in your class. Or even your own skepticism, your own questions that you have. Look at this one, First Peter Sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. You have to have, you have to have a understanding that you must be ready to answer anything at any time. Yes, you, not us MIBs. Okay, you guys, okay? MIB, men in black. You guys didn't get that? Wow. Okay, no comment, no comment. Hi, Ibuna. Okay, look at what the Bible tells us to do. We should no longer be children, children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, but the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. Okay? A lot of people speak the truth, but not in love. Out of hate, out of pride, out of vengeance, out of whatever reason. And people feel it. When you speak the truth in love, People will feel it. I can say that one thing to you and you could, I could get under your skin and you don't ever want to see my face again. And somebody else can say the same exact words. Exactly. And they will accept it. Speak the truth in what? Hmm? In love. Okay, which means you have to know what? You have to know the truth. And you have to know what is a lie. You have to know the truth and you have to know the lie. Okay? Look at this one. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy 
that happens on our campuses, okay? An empty deception in the movies, according to the tradition of men, like this Bishop Spong, according to the world, rather than according to Christ. You see, when we start believing, or we start kind of considering other things besides the Word of God, besides the Bible, besides those type of things, then we are like that picture. We're in chains. Our mind is in chains. Look at this one. This is a really important one to, to grasp. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the glory, honor, and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom hmm, I am, what? Well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the, mount, the holy mountain. I put this verse up because I wanted to make a point. Every New Testament book is written by an eyewitness to the life of the Lord. Again, every New Testament book is written by an eyewitness to the Lord. You will say, St. Paul, well, he did see him. And he was commissioned by Christ himself when he got thrown off the horse while he was going to Damascus. Okay? Everything we see, the first epistle of St. John, what we have seen, what we have handled, what we have touched, what we have tasted of the word of life. The first few verses of the Gospel of St. Luke. I am writing an account, as many as have taken, it, taken up to write an account to you, O most excellent Theophilus, of the things that have been happening, I, having a perfect understanding, is going to write an account. The Gospel of St. Luke. So it's an eyewitness account. Don't let anybody tell you. Okay? Why do we believe newspapers? Why do you, be why do you believe your textbook or your sociology book? Why do we take things for fact? But when it comes to the Bible, oh, nah, man-made. It makes uh, no sense. So what is our objective today? Okay? Our objective, my beloved, today is to understand, first of all, you have to be convinced of this before you do anything. You have to understand that we believe something because it is true. It's not because we believe something it is true. You get the difference? We believe something because it is true. I'll give you an example. If all of us here say, I believe that the sky is green. And we go out and we write a book and we say the sky is green. And we gra gather millions of people to say the sky is green. Is it true? No. This is what other religions do. What we do is, God himself has revealed the truth in his word, and we believe the truth. And it's because it is the truth that we believe it, and we die for it. Do you have any idea what type of heritage we have as Coptic Orthodox Christians? And many people get upset when we priests talk about this idea of we have to be conscious of the idea or the, our heritage. You have any idea how many, for example, just in, in the martyrdom, the number of martyrs in the world. Guess who offered the most martyrs to the Lord? Anybody want to take a guess? Egypt. And guess what? You don't believe me? Don't worry, don't believe me. Find the book, The History of the Church by Eusebius. He was a bishop of Caesarea in the third century, the first one to write a history of the church. And you know what he said? He said, 
if you take all the martyrs of the world and put them on one side of the scale, and then all the martyrs of Egypt on the other side of the scale, the scale will tip in favor of Egypt. Just the martyrdom. Our heritage is great, my beloved, and we're not about to let it go because some Dan Brown decides to write this book, Da Vinci Code, or uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. Theory, theory. An educated, but a very, an educated guess. Okay, which by the way, there's a document now out, written, uh, signed by about 500 PhD, worldwide PhDs, scientists, who say we can no longer ascribe, if that's a big word for you, agree, <laughs> agree to Darwin's theory of evolution. Over 500 worldwide PhD scientists. And they're not Christians. Some of them may be, some of them maybe not, but okay. So then why are they teaching it still in the schools as fact? You know, like we really have to be conscious of what's going on around us. We have to understand what is what is the battle against us. Because you know what? If you ask yourself, why are people so keen on destroying the foundation of the Bible? Why? Anybody have an idea? Anybody want to give a, a guess? Okay, yeah. Some people look at the Bible as a, a book of laws, freedom. Basically, what they want to do is get rid of anything that tells them how to live their life or the guidelines. Okay? So people living immoral lives. A perfect example, the homosexuals. Okay? Look at what they're doing. Gene Robinson, the first Episcopal bishop who is an active homosexual man living with his partner. And he's a bishop in a so-called Christian church. Do you know what today? So funny, I, I just remembered Gene Robinson. Today I, got, I was checking the messages on the, the church uh, phone. And I got this message from this lady, Linda Yost. Called her back. She's like, uh, Father, this is kind of strange, but I'm looking for a church that believes in the Bible and what's written in it. Because I'm tired of what's going on. I said, well, you found it. And then she started to tell me who and what kind of background she was. And she mentioned that she was Episcopal. Same bishop we just quoted. Same bishop, Gene Robinson, from his church. So it's an amazing thing, you know. So we have to, we have to uphold eh, the authenticity, the validity, the veracity, the truth of the Holy Bible. Okay, so how are we going to do this? I have one, two, three, five or six points. Okay? Now, before I get into it, I want to tell you that these five or six points have nothing to do with faith. Because I could go to somebody on campus, my Catholic friend or my Protestant friend who's completely lost faith, and say, come on, don't you believe that this is the word of God? He says, well, prove it to me. So, well... I believe it. Okay, that's fine. You believe it. I don't. See you later. End of discussion. You can't use your faith as a reason to say that the Word of God is the Word of God. You can't do that. Okay? This is why it said that first verse, wisdom. You have to have wisdom to know how to answer. <clears throat> to know how to answer others. Okay? So I'm going to give you an acrostic right now. And it's the word, Bible. If you can remember this, you'll have five arguments. And I added 
another one. It probably be, I should have put Bibles with an S. But we'll just do Bible because it only fit that word there. B-I-B-L-E, okay? If you just remember those five letters, you'll be able to have just one point or five points, okay, on how to be able to defend the Bible as the Word of God without saying or using the word faith. Because if you go to a Muslim or a non-Christian and you say, here, this is the Bible, this is the Word of God, and you can't prove to him logically, he'll just say, oh, that's very nice. I respect everybody. But you know what? You didn't do anything for me. Okay? So the first point, as you can see, is the bibliographic evidence. The bibliographic evidence. How do we know that the Bible of today is even close to the original? Well, I'll give you a little bit of a background. I'll give you a little bit of a background of how the Bible, at least the Old Testament, came to us. Firstly, the Old Testament scribes. Scribes are people that rewrite the manuscripts, the scrolls. Scrolls don't last forever. Not even computers last forever. So they had to find a way to rewrite the text of the Bible, the scroll, in a very accurate way. So these people, they were born and bred just to do that. They did nothing else. And by the way, every time they came to the word God in the, in the, the text, they would get up, they would change their clothing, go take a shower, change their clothing, and come back. Because they felt this was the holy task that they were doing. Okay? And the way that they would check on themselves. So let's say this page has 250, 500 uh, words, or letters, I should say. 500 letters. They pick the middle letter, the 250th letter, right? And let's say it's an A. They check in the original if it's an A. And then they check a, the same thing in the copy that they've just copied. If it is, they keep it. If it isn't, they tear it up and they start over again until it's done. They were very, very, very careful how they would transcribe the Bible from the scroll that they had to the new scroll, as you can see um, on the screen. Okay? Now, because they believed they were transcribing the Word of God, they were very careful. <clears throat> and by the way, the earliest text we had, for you historians, the earliest text we have, or had, of the Old Testament was dated 900 A.D. Okay? You got it? So it was the, own, the, 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 most, um, the closest text that we had, the oldest text of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the whole Old Testament was from the year 900 A.D. until something happened. Until something happened in 1949 something called the Dead Sea Scrolls. In 1949, in the caves of Qumran, there was, next to the Dead Sea, there were some Bedouins, some people just walking around, you know, traveling, caravans. And they would go into these type of caves, if you can see that one on the left. And there's one of the caves in which the jars were found. And they actually went in, you know, they were taking a break for the night, it was cold, going in, and they found these jars. And if you can see, there's Jerusalem, Jordan River, the Mediterranean. And here's where I'm talking about the Qumran caves or the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is what they call them. Okay? So they went in there and they saw these big, huge pottery things filled with these scrolls. So what did they do? They needed to start a fire. So they started taking scroll out and so they can get warm. And that's what they did. Then one of them realized, wow, wait a minute, this could be something really ancient. <laughs> so they stopped burning them, okay? And <clears throat> they brought them to uh, a Syrian Orthodox bishop, which is our sister church. And they took them, and I forget the, 
the Metropolitan's name, but he authenticated it and he gave it, um, he sold it to some museum to keep it safe because he knows that the, the major museum, the British Museum, all those things, the Louvre, they keep these things very, um, <clears throat> or the Vatican, I think. So uh, he gave it to them, okay? And um, in it, they found one complete copy of the scroll of Isaiah and thousands of fragments representing every Old Testament book except the book of Esther. I think that was the one that was burned. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, we're talking about what? What are we talking about? We were talking about bibliographic what? Evidence. Okay, so now, by the way, Guess when they dated this, these Dead Sea Scrolls too? Remember how it said that the earliest copy they had was when? 900 AD. Guess when these were dated back to? 200 BC, before Christ. Okay, before Christ. 200. Yeah, um, I don't recall. They don't mention them. They don't. Well, actually, no. No, yes. Yes, they did. They did. Yes. The only book that was missing was Esther. Yes. So that tells you something. Now, let's take a look at the New Testament. The New Testament, there are more than 5,000 different ancient Greek manuscripts containing all portions of the New Testament that have survived to our time which were written on different types of material, whether they were clay, whether they were scrolls, whether they were papyrus, whatever they were. But they found over 5,000 different type of manuscripts or materials that have the New Testament written. Not 5,000, guys. 5,000. I'm giving you scientific evidence. I'm not giving you things of faith because we think it. These things are located in the world, university, uh, the world museums. They're there. You can go and go to Israel right now, and you'll find the, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you could actually see them. You could actually look at them. You can't touch them, but you could see them. And Bebshoi, Metropolitan Bebshoi, uh, when he was here last year, the year before, he says that he, he has um, an original fragment, I think, from one of the books of the New Testament. He has the actual, he bought it. He bought it himself. And he's keeping it in his, uh, in his uh, arch, uh, the diocese office there. Okay, so these things exist. These are real things. So somebody tells you, ah, it's man-made. Ah, you say, no, no, no. By uh, bibli bibliography or manuscripts, manuscripts and the ac accuracy of them. Okay, these, these things are facts, Habib. These things are facts. There are over 1,000 copies of fragments in, of the New Testament translated in Syria, Coptic, Armenian, Gothic, Ethiopian. 8,000 cop, uh, copies of the Latin Vulgate dating far back as 384 when St. Jerome translated the Greek into Latin. Okay, and that's what the Roman Catholic Church uses as their Bible, the Vulgate, they call it, translated by St. Jerome. The entire New Testament, get this, can be reconstructed from quotations in the writings of the church fathers. Could you believe that? Except for about 15 to 20 verses. So if every single Bible in the whole entire world was disposed of, we would still be able to retrieve everything except about 15 to 20 verses. Okay? It's amazing. It's amazing. So people wrote about the Bible. And they wrote it so accurate, they quoted it. You know how our fathers used to do it. They'd take a verse, and then they'd comment. They'd take a verse and comment. If you ever read the commentary of St. John Chrysostom on uh, Saint, the Gospel of St. Matthew, it's about a thousand-page book for 28 chapters of a Bible, of the, of the Gospel. St. Matthew only has 28 chapters, and he has a volume about a thousand pages commenting on it. Imagine that. So you can re reconstruct the entire Gospel of St. Matthew just from that volume. Okay. I try to do a comparison for you between the type of ancient manuscripts, the numbers. So you know Caesar's uh, Gallic Wars and all of these other ones, Homer's Iliad. 
There are 10 ancient, you see them, 10, 2, 8, 8, and 643. Now let's take a look at a, the New Testament. Greek manuscripts, 5,686. Latin, 10,000. Coptic and the others, 8,000. A total of about 24,000 manuscripts. Plus 32,000 citations from the pre-Nicene Church Fathers. Facts, guys. I didn't say faith. Facts. I'm giving you facts. This is a time test. What is this? What is this time test? The time between the original, when, the, when Caesar's Gallic Wars was written, and when the first copy appeared, or the first copy we have of it. Okay? So his, uh, I gave example for two of them. His is written, it was written in 60 B.C., and the earliest copy we have is 900 A.D., about 1,000 years from the time that the original and then the first copy showed up. You guys got that? So look at, look at uh, Plato. 400 B.C., 900 A.D. So he was, he was writing in 400 B.C., right? And the first copy shows up at 900, okay? About 1,300 years and so forth. Let's look at the New Testament. Look at this. The New Testament was authored between around 50 to 100 A.D. Correct? All right. So what's the earliest fragment? So how many years is that? If we say that the last book was written 100. So what's 114 minus 100? 14 years. Not 1,000 years. Not 1,300 years. Do you guys get how significant this is? This is a very significant point. That we have manuscripts that are so close to the original. And they're identical. Okay. I think we covered that. All right. Now here's the next letter. I. We did the B in Bible. B, I. I, internal harmony. Okay, quickly, written over a period of 1,600 years by 40 different people from many different places in three different languages, many controversial subjects, written in many literary styles, but yet, despite all of that, it's one unified book with a consistent message. Never any sort of contradictions. Guys, that's impossible. It's impossible for it to be done if it wasn't the Bible. We can take you guys. Once somebody did this experiment. They took 10 people with the same educational so, uh, and all that stuff, the backgrounds, right? And wrote about one single topic. Would they agree? Absolutely not. They didn't agree. There was no way. But yet, you have 40 people who don't know each other, who share different languages, different trades, different backgrounds, different everything. And they write and it's, they, the church compiles it. And oh my Lord, it's the same exact thing. It's the same consistent theme throughout. Wow. Not even, no holy book in the world is like that. Except the Holy Bible. Okay? It's very, very significant. Okay. I'll go quickly. Another B. So we did B, I. What's the next letter? B, Bible prophecy. What is prophecy? It's history written before it happens, right? Simple, very simple definition, correct? You guys with me? You're awake? Okay. It's just something that's going to happen, but it's written before it happens, right? Okay. So now, <clears throat> only God could have written those prophecies, and then a had them fulfilled. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Because there are over 330 prophecies that deal with our Lord Jesus Christ. Could you believe that? 300. And the, the next like seven or eight slides are examples. So I'm just going to run through them really quick for the sake of time. Let's look at some of the prophecies. Born of a woman, born of a virgin, the seed of Abraham anointed by the Holy Spirit, heralded by the messenger of the Lord, would perform miracles, 
of the tribe of Judah, house of David. In Bethlehem he was born, would cleanse the temple, rejected by the Jews, die a humiliating death. The rejection, silence before accusers, being mocked. Look at this one, man. Piercing his hands and his feet. Psalm 22 speaks about the piercing of God's hands and feet. Being crucified with thieves, Isaiah. Praying for his persecutors, Isaiah. Buried in a rich man's tomb. Casting lots for his garments. These things that we know, we're, you know, we're more familiar. So I'm trying to highlight those. But it's an amazing thing. Written, Isaiah was written about, what, a thousand years before the Lord came, maybe? A thousand years. How did Isaiah know? How? It can't possibly happen. Except if it was written by, the God, by God. He would rise from the dead, would sit on the right hand of the Father. Okay. This is really amusing. I love this example. Some guy named Peter Stoner, okay, who's a very good Christian man, he was a mathematician, and he took this mathematical theory equation, something called the law of compound probabilities. Any of you who are mathematicians know what I'm talking about. And he said, he had his class sit and calculate what the chance of one person fulfilling eight just eight prophecies, not 330 plus, just eight. And he found, according to his calculations, the probability was that it was one times 10 to the 17th power. Now, do you understand that number? I have no idea what that means. I just know it's a big number, right? Okay. To understand the number, he made it easier for us. He said, if you take the entire state of Texas... The entire state of Texas, right? I think, isn't it the largest state? It's the largest state, right? Or is it Alaska? No, California's not larger than Texas. Texas, isn't it? We should know our geography better, huh? <laughs> What's the capital of Texas? Nope, not Houston. Austin. <laughs> What's the capital of Florida? It's the capital of New Jersey. What's the capital of New York? Okay, good. All right, halas. <laughs> okay. He said, this number, 1 times 10 to the 17th, this is like a probability, right? So he said, he said, that you take the entire state of Texas and you fill it up with quarters up until about maybe a foot high. The entire state. And then you take one of those quarters, you mix, I'm not I'm sorry, you don't mix it, you, you get like a marker, you mark it up, red, you throw it in there and mix it, and then you take somebody like Andrew, you blindfold them and you say, Andrew, pick it on the first try. That's the chance of one person fulfilling eight. The Lord fulfilled over three Hundred prophecies proven it has to be the word of God. It has to be the word of God. Okay, we did B I B. What's the next letter? L. The Lord's view of the scripture. B-I-B-L. We have one more letter and then I added another one. The Lord's view of Scripture. Look at what he says in John 7. Did not Moses, Moses give you the law, yet none of you keep the law? He was upset with them. So he acknowledged Moses. And in some place I remember now, he said the law of who? Moses. He said the temple of who? Solomon. Okay? So he was acknowledging that these people existed. Look what he says. You have heard that it was said to those of the old times, you shall not commit adultery. And then he goes on to say what? If you look at a woman to lust after her, you have what? Committed adultery in your heart. Okay. So he's referring to the law of the old. He's giving it the authority of God's word by just referring to Moses and the commandment. You guys know the Ten Commandments? 
If I were to take a, tell you to take a piece of paper out right now, I did this with our servants over there when I first became a priest. And they didn't like it. <laughs> I told them, take out a piece of paper right now. Put your Bibles away and give me the Ten Commandments in order. And of course, Ten Commandments. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's just like the ABCs. If you guys don't know the Ten Commandments, we're in big trouble. I hope you can go home tonight. You know what I'm going to do? One sec, forgive me. I'm going to flex some authority right now, okay? You have to. You hear this? You have to, before you sleep tonight, take out a piece of paper. Go, well, what book is it in? Does anybody know that? Huh? What chapter? Huh? 20, very good. So you must know your, your commandments. Before you go to bed. Hmm? Don't cheat with that phone. No Googling. Put that away. No, no, no reminders. Here's the reminder. Write down the Ten Commandments and read them about 20 times. So at least maybe, maybe it'll get in there. Okay? So he's giving here authority to God's Word. L, the Lord's view of it. Okay? Look at this. Matthew 5. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy but fulfill. And then look what this one says. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by no means will eh, pass away. Okay? So, so far we have B, I, B, L. This next one is also a big one too. It's a very powerful, powerful, powerful one. Powerful reason to believe that the book that has a lot of dust on your nightstand or in your closet the book that you haven't picked up probably in a very long time and read is the Word of God. E. External evidence. External evidence. Archaeology. What do I mean by external evidence? Archaeology and extra-biblical writings. Meaning, writings that are not from the Bible or any way, shape, or form connected, connected to the Bible. Okay? I'm going to give you some examples of archaeology. And this is definitely not an exhaustive list, but this is something that you should kind of be aware of. Something called the Ebla Tablets in Syria, 1974. They found it. 16,000 clay tablets they found, dating back to, look at the date, 2,000-something, B.C. They confirmed names like Ur. Who was from Ur? Ur of the Chaldeans. Hmm? Abraham, very good. Why only the older people know that these answers, guys? The older servants, huh? Sodom, Gomorrah, Baal. Who is Baal? Okay, good. A god with a, a small g. Okay, Adam and Eve, you know them? Figure it out. The god of the Old Testament, like the, one of those, uh, the gods that they used to... Even Noah. These names were written. Yes. Yes. They use many. I'm not. I'm not an expert. I can't tell you. But um, uh, they do carbon dating. They do. Um, now there's a new technique. Uh, some some sort of uh, what's it called? Radioactive materials. They use some radioactivity because they found that the carbon dating. Is, is not as accurate as they had thought. Because in the previous, when the earth was very young in its age, there was a lot of carbon everywhere. So if you're using carbon to date something, and there was a lot of carbon, and you find that there's a lot of carbon in this thing you're dating, then you're going to come up with a, a, a figure of like 10 million years, when actually it wasn't. It was just because there was so much carbon. Okay, that was proven scientifically. So carbon dating is eh, not that much, not that good reliable but they do things with radioactivity now i'm not sure how but this is how they dated those things okay look at these these are names on tablets that they found in the ground archaeology i didn't say the word faith a coin says house of david david who king david 
True or false? David wrote all the Psalms. Who else? Give me one name that they wrote. And? And? Somebody with an A. Yes, Asaph. Very good. 26,000 tablets from, very, from every Old Testament, re- affirm every Old Testament reference to an Assyrian king called Sennacherib. Dum, da, dum, dum. It's in the Bible. All this stuff is in the Bible. Okay, look at this. Records found in ancient Babylon affirm that the te- treatment of the Hebrew royal family and the decree allowing the Jews to rebuild the temple by Ezra, the priest. Okay, I'm almost done. I know it's, I'm over my time. Unique places in Jerusalem from John's gospel have been located archaeologically. Pool of Bethesda, Pool of Siloam, Jacob's Well. Guys, facts. Facts. Okay, remember how I said archaeology and extra-biblical writings. This man, Tacitus, is a Roman historian. And this man, Josephus, is a Jewish philosopher. Guess what? Uh, I didn't include the slide because these are like 50-some slides, but... Josephus, you can get from Josephus' account the fact that the Lord, they used to call him in their writings, Christos. Some guy by the name of Christos did miracles. But the, he said it wasn't miracles. He used sorcery to do it. But he wrote it. He's not a Christian. He has no interest in propagating what we believe. Right? He has no interest. Tacitus was a Roman historian, a pagan. Christianity? No, no, no. We don't believe that. But he still wrote about these events that happened. Not, of course, in the detail that we have in the Bible, but at the same time, it's significant that each of them, non-Christians, wrote that a, there was some guy named Christos, Christ. Actually, If you really use your time well and you dig into these sources, I found, and I lost it, I found a a description of the Lord's face. You have it? Because I I can't, I don't know where I put it and I can't remember the guy's name and I can't find it. Okay. Well, this guy, possibly. And this was, this was a writing, one of these extra-biblical, extra-Christian writings. It says his name was something really like 15 letters long, you know, those Roman names back then. And then, a, and then he, he started describing how and what the Lord looked like. And as soon as I read it, tears came to my eyes. Not because it was beautiful, not because it was, although it was, the description, but because... Every time I see an icon, if it's an authentic Coptic icon, I see the description of what they, that he said. He said his hair was like a light golden brown. He said that his hair had a split in the middle. He said that his hair was straight against his face and then it hit his shoulders and curled up. He said that he had a little V part in his beard. That one doesn't. That it should. All the Coptic icons have the Lord with a little V in his beard. Okay? They said, he, they, it's, he said that his face was without blemish and his eyes were so powerful like the sun. He couldn't stand to look at his eyes. Unbelievable. Hmm? I, I don't know. I lost it. I, I don't know where. Okay, and then, oh, I found another thing too. A letter from Caesar, a letter from Caesar, Augustus Caesar, the second, third, whatever, which one, wherever one it was, to Pontius Pilate. Saying what to him? Actually, I apologize, I apologize. A letter from Pontius Pilate to Caesar. Responding to a letter from Caesar, Caesar in his letter wrote, said, actually there are two letters. Caesar wrote to him and said, I heard that there's this guy Christos in Judea, Palestine. 
Send him to me because my daughter is sick. Guess what? It was after the crucifixion. He wrote back and said, My Lord, Augustus, Caesar, Pontifus, Maximus. He was killed. I, I ordered him to be crucified. And then he explained the Jews, da da da, and all of this. He summoned him to Rome and he cut his head off. He said, How could you do such a thing? Caesar told Pilate to come and he killed him because he killed the Lord. He gave the order. This is written, extra biblical sources. Imagine. So what you guys have in your, in your hand and in your homes is the word of God. Without a doubt, so many different sources and so many different evidences. Okay? Quickly, quickly, this is, this is what I added. Scientific accuracy. Okay? Scientific accuracy. Look at this. 15th century scientists discovered that the word world was not flat but round. 2,200 years before that, the Holy Bible said it. Look at this. Isaiah 40. He who sits above the circle of the earth. Circle. Not a disc of the earth. A circle. Look at this one. Before the invention of the telescope and modern discovery of the number, the, the number of stars are countless. You know that in the, in the mid, uh, Middle Ages, medieval times, they said that you could count the stars. Well, now we know that they're uncountable. Jeremiah in, said that. The host of heaven cannot be numbered. What does the Bible say about itself? I hope we know this verse. And I hope you live it. And I hope you learn it. I hope you teach it to your children. Your, not your physical children, but your spiritual children. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And one last proof that I added to, to the B-I-B-L-E, is it's transforming power. You read the Bible, you're transformed. If you have your Bible shut, and you don't read it, then you ask yourself, probably, why can't I change? Why isn't there any movement in my spiritual life? I'm doing the same thing over and over again. There's no growth in anything. Everything is so dry. Everything is just so blah. You know what? I'm going to go tell Abuna, this year, excuse me from the service. I'm tired. It's just not working. And why? It's because you don't have your Bible open, because you're not reading it, because you're not living the life that you and I are called to live. I hope and I pray that you can see that the Bible, that book that you have in your hands, is truly the Word of God. It's an amazing book. I would advise you to get to know it. The problem with us, my beloved, is that we decide to read books about the Bible, not the Bible. That's our problem. And that's why we don't know, the pro we don't know our Bible. And that's why the Protestants blow us out of the water. They can quote you the entire New and Old Testament. Anywhere, anything. You ask, there it is. I had this one Protestant guy come into communion. We had an emba... I think it was Amber Macarius at the church. And he was giving the body. And so, as any priest in his church, you know who people are. And when you see a strange face, you just politely ask, well, where are you from? And what are you? And who are you? And are you Orthodox? Are you baptized? you have a spiritual father? Have you taken confession? Do you do all of these things? Because I don't know the person. And I, I'm responsible to give them the body and the blood. And I can't give if, it, if they're not okay. So... He goes online, and I didn't notice because I'm giving the blood, and he takes the body. And so I'm, every time I say, the body of Christ, the true, um, true blood of Christ, the cup of life, the true blood of Christ. And by the way, what are you supposed to answer to that? If you don't answer to it, Abuna shouldn't give you communion. Because that's your faith. 
And I'll explain to you in a minute why and where that's from. So anyway, cup of life, the body, the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ. And all of a sudden I see this blue-eyed, blonde-haired guy. And I just, I stop. I never saw him before. And I say to him, I, I just smile at him. And I say, uh, hi. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. Huh? It was very, because he, I, he obviously took, took the body. I said, okay. Um, I said, are you, uh, are you baptized? He said, uh, I believe in Jesus Christ. I said, good, I do too. <laughs> really, while I'm holding the cup, I do too. You know, God forgive me for speaking. We're not supposed to speak around the cup. Or the, the holiest time is when we're distributing. Christ is among us and we're consuming him. And yet we all, ta 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 and we have our cell phones and we're doing this and we're looking up and we're looking this. And then, be careful, guys. We're in the presence of God. So anyway, he says, uh, so I say, okay, that's good. I, I believe too. Uh, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he's my savior. I believe he just, because I stopped the whole line. And I was standing in the middle aisle in the back. So everybody saw it. And so I asked him one simple question. I said, you see this? Do you believe that this is the true blood of the Lord that, that was shed on the cross or not? He says, no. I said, this is a symbol. I said, sir, I cannot give you this. And I would like your phone number. And I would like to meet with you today and speak to you after church and so he said okay and he politely he didn't hit me he didn't scream he could have I mean think about it one lady did she didn't hit me but she screamed at me because I wouldn't give her the communion and uh, she came, uh, he came uh, and so later after we did everything I'd say they didn't know it wasn't the church that he you know he doesn't know the people in the church so he just gives the communion whoever, but whoever's on the line so later on, I met with him, and we proceeded to sit twice that week for about two to three hours each time. This was about four or five months ago. He called me today, and I called him back. And he read like seven or eight of the books that I gave him. And he said, that Pope of yours, the guy, I can't, I can't say his name. I said, Shenouda. He said, he, wow, his books are amazing. I said, yeah, which ones did you read yet? And he gave me the ones he read. I told him, did you read comparative theology yet? Because it talks about the differences between us and the Protestants. And you know that, right? Hmm? Comparative theology. Okay? And that's a good book. And I hope you're building your own library. And I hope you're reading and reading and memorizing. Okay? And he said, no, I didn't get to that yet. I said, that's going to be a very interesting one for you. And I hope that you could, uh, you know. Actually, I forgot a detail. I called him about a month or two ago. He didn't answer me. I said, oh boy, that's it. And then he called me. So, guys, it's an amazing thing what we have. Okay? It's an amazing thing that our Bible is a, the word of God. And by the way, do you know why the priest says this is... Uh, actually, he's supposed to say two, two things, okay? He's supposed to say if he's giving the body, okay? Uh, he's supposed to say this is the bread of life, the body of Christ, the true body of Christ. Amen. This is the cup of life, the true blood of Christ. You know where that's written from? The Apostolic Constitution, the first century document. The instructions of the apostles. Could you believe we still do that? Could you believe it says in that book, it says that we should, while the distribution of communion is going on, we should be singing hymns. Isn't that what we do? So we're doing, we're keeping a tradition that's been in the church for about 2,000 years. That should be very impressive to you. I was floored when I saw that. Then I read the rest of the book, 
and I realized that it talked about the Igbeya. It talked about how the men should go first in communion, then the women representing the angels and so forth, representing how Adam was created first, then Eve second. Um, it talked about how women should sit on one side and men should sit on the other. Not, not specifically like that, like groups, like widows, widowers, deacons, priests. And that's why in the Kabbalah, Ba'dukum Ba'dan, greet another with a kiss, a holy kiss. You should only greet your own rank. Okay? So if you're standing next to Abuna, don't be going like this to him. Okay? If I'm standing next to a bishop, I don't go like this to him. They greet themselves. I greet my brothers, the priests. You greet your brothers, the chanters and the readers and the subdeacons and so forth. Okay, there's order in the church of God. So anyway, I don't know where I was going with that, but basically, um, do you have any questions? <laughs> so before we get into that, do anybody have any questions about our topic? Yes, Mark. Sure. The Septuagint is the translation of the 70, the 70 elders. Just, uh, no, 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 not turn it off. Just power it down because it'll blow up. Yeah. Oh, okay, keep it on, keep it on. I just didn't want it to overheat. So the Septuagint is the, uh, first of all, the Old Testament. Septuagint is always referring to the Old Testament. Okay. Originally written in what language? Hebrew. During the, uh, um, the reign of Antiochus Epiphanius, when the Greeks and Romans entered into uh, Alexandria and they took over, right? There was this Hellenization, Hellenization, you know, Greekization of, of, a, of the whole world. And even the, the Jews. Josephus was a Hellenized Jew. And so, instead of reading the Old Testament in Hebrew, they had these 70 scholars translated into the Greek. And so, the Orthodox Church were supposed to use the Septuagint as our Old Testament. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ quoted the Old Testament from the Septuagint quotes. Okay? not from the Hebrew text. Okay? So that's where that fits in. And it was 70 elders, and you know one of them was Simon, right? Simon the priest. Remember that tradition that we have in the Synexar? Right? Simon, Simeon? He was, sure, he was one of the 70 who was translating. And he was translating the part of Isaiah chapter 7, Verse 14, if I remember correctly, it says, a virgin shall give birth. And so he stopped and he said, no, 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 this must be wrong. He wrote a young girl, a young woman, something. And so then the angel of the Lord appeared and said, no, virgin, and you will not die. Your eyes will not close until you see the salvation of the Lord. You'll see the baby that is born of the virgin. And then when he came, when the Lord came into the temple, he said, behold, I have seen a salvation, etc., etc. Anybody else have any questions? Um, there's a, uh, uh, actually, I have it in Coptic, translated into English. I found it from a company that reprints out-of-print books. It's called Kessinger. K-E-S-S-I-N-G-E-R, Kessinger, I think, .net, .org, something like that. Just Google it and you'll get it. And you'll find all of these. It has the story of the Copts as well. I got another copy of that. And it has the Paradise of the Fathers, all the sayings of the Desert Fathers. That's out of print. And St. Shenouda's Monastery. Yes. Well, the Septuagint is Greek. See, Old Testament is Hebrew. And it was the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew. 
So we use, we're supposed to use that. Got it? does that yet? <laughs> he said he said the saida <laughs> yeah. well some uh, abuna the halim uh, god uh, reposed his soul when he was giving us old testament in the seminary he told us that if you ever have a trouble with a translation, you go back to the Greek or the Hebrew. But if you don't know that, he says, don't ever go to the Arabic. Because the Arabic, the words in Arabic are very a miliana. They have many, many different meanings, but the English is more specific. So, and then he even knew French, so he would go to the French sometimes. He'd first do the, the, the Greek, then the Hebrew, then try to understand it more. English than the French. Yes, and then we'll do that. Yes. Differences in grammar and words and no, so like, forth. Like, we were meeting one time in class, uh, I had the Orthodox story of Jonah, and he's like, in three days, Nineveh's going to burn, and then the Orthodox, it says, in 40 days. Yeah, yeah, it says 40 days. I know that's based on the Septuagint. Yeah, one says three and the other says 40. Are you sure about that? And there's differences in numbers. You checked both? Yeah, like, there's differences in numbers. Also, in another part. Somebody else mentioned that about the Hebrew or Yes, yes, the Old and the New Testament, yeah, yeah. Hmm. I wouldn't question you. Hmm. I don't know, I'd, I'd, have to, I'd, I'd have to do research. I really don't know, to be honest with you. Which English Bible is that? Exactly. So because like when it's all all the rhythm, you don't have the same kind of text. But the Bible is only just local like that has that kind of influence, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, have you? The Bible, <laughs> the Bible, the Bible, and the Bible. <laughs> There's nothing beside it. The Bible. <laughs> no, no. What? It's a good question because sometimes we don't know where to start. But firstly, you know, first of all, you should start where your spiritual father tells you. Okay, the life, the spiritual life, and the life with God is not a regular life. It's not you could just observe and learn, or you could just do it on your own. You have to live it. You have to be directed by someone to do. So, if it depends on who you are, what level you're at. But if you're a very, 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 very beginner, I would suggest, you know, if I was your spiritual father, I would say the Gospel of St. Mark. Start with the Gospel of St. Mark. It's very simple, filled with miracles, not too complex with theology, and it's the shortest Gospel. Second thing I, I would suggest is get yourself a good, Bible dictionary and get yourself another dictionary a regular dictionary get yourself a, an atlas a Bible atlas an atlas is where you have all those maps right you can tell where Judea is Jericho is Sodom Gomorrah Ur everything okay so when you're reading when, when it says he took, went from Judea and passed through Samaria okay where he met the Samaritan woman then you can see wow that's why he was tired and that's why it took him so long to get from here to there, because he had to pass this way, and it was noontime. So it's actually very accurate if you really sit and study the Bible. 
The second thing is definitely you got to do, you got to uh, do this consistently. You have to also read the Bible. Before you read the Bible, you have to approach it with, in a very prayerful and spiritual way. Like you're not reading the Bible with a cup of tea, you know, and some cookies that you're munching on, you know, or whatever. No, really, really. Some people I know, they stand when they read the Bible or they're kneeling when they're reading the Bible. I have this one little old teta that comes to me. She says, my knees hurt, Abuna, because I'm, I'm reading the Bible. I'm like, what do you mean? What do you need? Your knees? She said, well, I kneel when I, 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 I uh, read the Bible. And I can't anymore. And I feel so guilty. I said, no. You don't have to. You can sit. Because she's old. She's like 80-something or 70-something. And she's still doing that. See the respect? Second thing you have to go with the, to the Bible with is a very um, humble attitude. Some people read the Bible like this. I'm above. It's below. When actually... You know, this is the biblical criticism. This is the spirit that happened in the Renaissance in the Middle Ages. Whereas we should be humble and bow before the Word of God, acknowledging its authority and knowing that it changes us. We don't change it. Okay? Another way that you should read the Bible is ecclesially, which means churchly, which means through the sayings of the fathers, the sayings of the saints. You can, uh, you can get that. You, there's many references these days. There's a Nicene, post-Nicene, but that's Old English. You can get that 36 volumes for 300 bucks, 299 from CBD books. You can get the ancient Christian commentary on Scripture. That's, I just actually got that maybe like three, three months ago. I don't remember how many. It's maybe like 25 ver uh, volumes. And literally every verse is commented by like five, six, ten fathers of the church. So you don't know what the verse is. You go open your little commentary and you, you read it. And it tells you everything that St. Uh, Jerome said, that St. John Chrysostom, that St. Alexandros, that all these people said about it. Okay, and then you gotta, you gotta. The final thing you gotta read it with a, the acknowledgement or the willingness to obey it. Okay, some people read it for knowledge. Okay, you may be one of those. Some people read it because they feel obligated; they have to. Some people read it, okay, to obey it, to learn the way of God. Somebody once told me this little girl. You know what Bible stands for, Abuna? I said, what? Basic instructions before leaving earth. I'm like, oh, okay, that's a good one. Basic instructions before leaving. It's like your manual to get to heaven. You see? So we have to stop talking about reading the Bible and just do it. Just, if you're, if you're thinking about it, that means you're not doing it. You have to read your Bible all the time. It should never leave your side. You should have one with you everywhere. Anybody else have any questions? What version do you suggest? Uh, Pope Shenouda says we should use New King James Version. He says that's the closest one to, you know, what, what is right. Um, they are working on a new translation. Uh, His Grace Bishop uh, of Port Said, Tedros, he came out with one, a different translation of the New Testament, a Coptic translation but in Arabic. And then we have nothing in English yet. And Emba Bishoy, Metropolitan Bishoy, is also working on, on one as well. So until we get it. But until we get it, the New King James is, is good, according to His Holiness. Yes. Yes. Uh, you could, or what I would suggest is use the King James Version of the uh, Deuterocanonical books. You can, you can buy it, actually, it's like four or five bucks from Barnes and Noble. And it's free online, somebody's saying. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, Habibi. 
No, no, it's very valuable. It's very valuable. With the, the commentary is very valuable. Okay, but you know, just just again, you have more than one Bible. Use that. If you, there's something that you don't understand, look at the New King James. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Thank you.